If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 26. We are winding down the, the book of Acts. We have taken it verse by verse. We have studied and read every word in the book of Acts, and uh, it's been an awesome study, and I've enjoyed it so much. Uh, hold your finger there, too, and I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, part of my introductions is Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we'll be looking at verse 8 and 9 in just a second. Today we're going to talk about Paul's defense. Uh, last uh, week we talked about his o- opening statements, and uh, you know uh, he just shared his heart. Uh, he told King Agrippa and Festus uh, that I was one of you. Okay, I was a righteous Jew. Uh, I was a Pharisee. Uh, I was a part of the Sanhedrin. I knew the law. I was respected. I wore the robes. I did everything you did. Uh, And also I had the authority to arrest Christians. Back in Acts, it was called the way. And we remember that he was after folks and he was headed to Damascus to arrest Christians. And God, this is his whole testimony of what we saw last week. God blinded him for three days and said, listen, you need to accept me as your Lord and Savior. And on the road... Uh, to Damascus. God changed his heart, folks. And now he went from Saul to Paul. And immediately, folks, he went towards Jesus Christ. And folks, that's what, that's what repentance is. It's running in one direction or even walking in one direction, realizing you are heading the wrong way and turning around and heading towards Christ. Folks, I am telling you, Jesus' arms are always open for you. He is just asking you to repent of your sins and come to Him. And Paul had the attention of everybody in this courtroom. And I'm telling you today, it will just be a courtroom drama. It is amazing scripture that I want to share with you. So let me give you the outline if you have your bulletin. Number one, Paul's gospel presentation. He brings it to a a, a head there. He brings uh, the summary there in the first part of our Scripture. The second one is Festus' strong reaction. Festus, who obviously in knowing and listening and, and what was going on, did not understand who Jesus was and did not have the information that most people in the Palestine area had. And it still bewilders me to know that he was a soldier and a Roman soldier, and obviously he wasn't a part of the Jerusalem bunch. But he, you know, he should have known because Jesus for three years went all through that area. But Festus had a strong reaction uh, to Paul's uh, gospel presentation. And third, and, and, and here it is, Agrippa's tragic response. See, what some people think is, is if they don't think about it, if they don't deal with it, if they just put it out of their mind, it's okay. I, or, or even some people will say, well, I just don't believe the Bible. And folks, you, you have that right to do that. But folks, I am telling you, this Bible is God's holy word to mankind. This Bible is why we do what we do. We are following Jesus We are Jesus' followers, and we are following the Word of God. And there's no such thing as being neutral, okay? You're either for Him or you're against Him. Jesus has said that. He lays down the law, and Paul is sharing the gospel with these folks, a whole jammed courtroom of folks. And he literally puts Agrippa on the spot, and we will see that also. You know, Paul shared his heart to King Agrippa about Jesus' words and to him, to him personally and about salvation. The clear teaching in Scripture is that salvation comes to a person only by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay, it cost God something. He sent his son down here. His son lived a perfect life. He was born of a virgin. 
Okay, God placed the Holy Spirit in Mary. And I understand people have a hard time grasping that. But this is where faith comes in. You have to have faith. You have to believe in God. You have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. Okay, we can't save ourselves. If I was out in a boat and a bad storm came, and I fell overboard, and I was trying, and the wind was blowing, and it was getting away from me, I'm telling you, I could not literally pick myself up and put myself in that boat. But I'm telling you, we, before we were saved, we were in sin. We were in our sin. There were storms of life was blowing. And what Jesus does is he puts his hands out and says, take hold of my hand. I will help you. I will save you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. You can't go to church enough. You can't read the Bible enough. You cannot be good enough. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. It is the gift of God. Man, don't you like to get gifts? I've got a gift on today. I'm telling you, I'm going to wear this maybe next Sunday. No less, and folks, I'm not exaggerating, no less than 12 people have said something. Usually it's two or three. I said, Brother Mike, you're looking sharp today. <laughs> it cost me nothing. Now, my sweet mother-in-law bought it for me. Okay? She did. She bought me another one. See, not, not many of you said anything. Two weeks ago, I had a brown one on, and you just looked at me. Folks, I didn't pay a thing for it, but I have the privilege of wearing it. Folks, you can't buy your way into the kingdom of God. You've got to come the way God says. The way God says. Folks, it's free. Salvation is free. But yet people reject it. And it hurts my heart so much. God loves you so much. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Folks, if you would do it, you know, if you could do it, you know what you'd do? You'd brag about it. What do we do? We brag about everything. We brag about everything. And God says, no, no, we're not going to work that way. You come through the blood of Jesus Christ. You come through the cross, or you don't come at all. You don't make deals. Folks, I've heard endless people Try to make deals with God. God's not that way, folks. You don't make deals with God. You come on His terms. Now let's look back in Acts. Looks back in our text. We're in a courtroom. I'm telling you, when he gave his testimony, it got quiet. You could hear, have heard a pin drop in that place. And he just keeps speaking. He had the floor. He told Agrippa that, hey, don't get impatient. This is going to take a little time. And I'm telling you, in verse 19, you see the rest of his presentation, gospel presentation. Therefore, King Agrippa, therefore what? Therefore always means what's in the Scripture before? His salvation experience. He is saying, Jesus spoke to me personally. And I know Jesus has never spoke to me personally. I've never heard voices but I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is, you know, spoken to me time and time and time again. And I believe with all my heart, the Holy Spirit is going to speak to someone today. Someone today. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus in Jerusalem. I mean, he stayed there. He was with the apostles for just a short time. And I'm telling you, he hit the road running, preaching the Word of God. Matter of fact, if you remember back in early Acts in Damascus, he was run out of town. In Jerusalem, they tried to kill him. I mean, he was young in the ministry. But you know why? He was fired up about what happened in his life. He had been blinded. He had been blinded by Satan. He had been blinded by the world. He was lost. He was undone. 
He did not have, even though he had a great job, he did not have that purpose and drive in life. And God set him free. God turned the light on. And it says, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. And folks, that was an issue with the Jews. That's why they were saying, there's no way Jews, there was such prejudice with them. They wouldn't walk on the same side of the road. They would not shake their hands. They did not believe that they belonged in the New Testament church. And he, he tried and tried his own brethren. He went to the synagogues first and preached, but they would not listen to him. And this is what he's saying, so I moved on. And it says that they should repent and turn to God and do works benefiting repentance. You know how I know if somebody's repented or not? They have changed their heart and they have changed their ways. See, we all have this image of who we think we ought to be. But folks, the Bible tells us, folks, we come to God. We are just, we are just sinners. We don't tell Him what we're going to do. Paul's saying, I got my instructions from God. And repentance is a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of my ways. And it says, For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing, both to the small and the great, saying, No other thing than those which the prophets Moses said would come. What is he saying? They would have pulled me apart and tore me apart in the temple. They would have killed me right there, except God intervened through a Roman soldier. And then he mentions the Old Testament. Folks, you have to realize at this time, the, the New Testament hadn't even been written. Okay, it had not even been written. So all that he witnessed and all that these men were doing was through the Old Testament, okay? Verse 23, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. I'd like you to look at two Old Testament scriptures, Isaiah chapter 9. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9 speaks of Jesus' birth. His birth. Folks, this was written 700 years before the birth of Christ. You tell me the Bible's not real? Folks, it's real from Genesis to Revelation. For Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Child is capitalized, means deity. Joseph wasn't his biological father. Unto us a son is given, capital S, God was his father, and the government will be up on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Oh, folks, while he was here, he was every one of those things. He is still every one of those things. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, God is coming, folks. Jesus is coming. And He is coming soon. And He's going to rid this world of sin. He will, folks. He will. And it says, upon the throne of David and over His kingdom in order, and to order and establish it with judgment and justice. Oh, read Revelation. Study Revelations. It is clear, clear in Scripture from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Folks, it's not, you know, he, he might be coming. Oh, no, don't, don't let Satan fool you, folks. He's coming. He's coming, and you need to be ready. Look at Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 speaks of his death. Speaks of his death. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, talking about Jesus. A man of sorrows, capital M, is deity, acquainted with grief. We hid as it, as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. 
I am telling you, the Pharisees hated him. Why? Because he told the truth. People hated him. Why? Because he told the truth. For surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. Now look what he did for you. He was wounded for our transgressions. Folks, he was beaten. Beaten. His blood was shed for you and me in our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he is telling Agrippa and Festus, he's saying the Old Testament Scripture proves that Jesus is the Messiah. And one more Scripture in the New Testament. Go with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, Paul writing to the church at Colossae, Colossae. Colossians chapter 1, speaking of Jesus. And everywhere in this scripture you see he and him, you could plug Jesus' name in, and that's the way I'm going to read it. It won't change a thing. It'll just let you know who Jesus is. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is God and was God in the flesh, the firstborn over all creation. He was there at creation. He wasn't created. Jesus and God always was. For by him all things were by by Jesus all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And Jesus is before all things. And in Jesus, all things consist. Folks, he was in creation. Everything that you see, all right, is because of Jesus. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things Jesus may have preeminence. Let me tell you something, folks. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is the reason we get up in the morning. Jesus is the reason we go to church. Jesus is the reason we read our Bible. Jesus is above everything. He is the absolute most important Thing in a Christian's life, and he is the center of everything we believe. It is Jesus. So Paul just says, hey, I got news for you folks. Maybe you don't believe it, but I'm telling you, Jesus is real. Jesus is real. So we see his final part of the gospel presentation. Now go back with me to Acts chapter 26. And let's see Festus' strong reaction. Verse 24, now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, okay, Festus is hearing all this, okay, I mean, Paul is preaching the gospel and telling them, man, you need to be saved. You need to get right with the Lord. You need to repent. And Festus had had all he could take. He did not at that time have the knowledge he did not have the information. And folks, I'm telling you, information about the Bible and Christianity and churches is all in salvation. It's all over the internet. I'm telling you, we can, we can listen to somebody online that is preaching in China. The gospel is everywhere. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, now we are without excuse. If you are sitting here today, you are not going to have an excuse if you walk out of here not knowing Jesus Christ. So Festus screams, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Two observations there. Number one, he thought, man, this Paul dude knows a lot. That's one smart guy. I don't know where he got all this stuff. And I'll tell you where he got it. He got it from the Word of God. He got it from inspiration of God. And the second thing he's saying 
You crazy. And you know what the crazy part was? You're telling me a man lived his life, perfect life. You're telling me he died, and three days later he arose? What was he thinking? He was thinking in worldly standards. He was thinking, that's never happened. That's, there is no way that's going to happen. There is no way. Paul, you're crazy. Are you out of your mind is what he's saying. Verse 25, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak the words with truth and reason. What did Festus, what was the deal? What was he thinking? He was thinking, and, and folks, I believe personally that Festus was under conviction. Okay? So when, when you hear something that you don't like, or something that you don't agree with, you just, at first, just reject it. You say, there's no way. Paul, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. And, and he's saying, I am telling you the truth. That's what truth and reason is. I've taken the time to explain this to you. So he was saying, Festus, you are without excuse. And folks, the whole thing comes down to Jesus. And Jesus saves. It comes down to that. In this scripture, Acts chapter 4, go back there. Look at Acts chapter 4. Peter preaching. Peter preaching. And I'm telling you, he was boldly proclaiming the word of God. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, or, or 11, excuse me. Acts 4, 11. Peter says this, The stone which was rejected by you builders which has become the chief cornerstone. Folks, they built a temple. But folks, I'm telling you, that what, when Christ died, the temple was no longer needed. Jesus. There's no more animal sacrifices now. Jesus the Messiah came while they were there, and they would not acknowledge Jesus for who He truly was. They just said, you're the son of Joseph. You're a nobody. What's wrong with you? And listen to this, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Oh, folks, the world's trying to tell you there's many ways to heaven. Certain religions is trying to tell you if you'll do it their way. But according to the Word of God, folks, it's all about Jesus. You must come to Jesus. You must come in repentance. You must come through the cross. So we see, I'm just telling you, Paul is just, he, he, is, he is just driving home the point that whether you agree with me or not, it is going to happen. Now look at verse 26. For the king, but for whom I freely, freely speak, knows these things. See, his wife was of, Jewish, you know, descent. And, and he had been around that. He had been around, King Agrippa had been around enough to know who Jesus was and what was going on. So he kind of deflects what Festus is, Festus is saying. Okay, he's saying, i got a witness in this courtroom. I mean, he didn't say it, but that's literally what he's saying. I can tell you, Agrippa knows what I'm saying, and Agrippa knows this is right. For I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. He's simply saying, I'm telling you, Jesus was here. Jesus did live. Jesus was the God-man. Jesus did die on the cross. And you can only be saved through Jesus Christ. Hold your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. And it's simply says, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What did Festus say? Paul, you're nuts. You're crazy. What are you talking about a cross? What are you talking about somebody rising from the dead? You're out of your mind. And folks, to the world, they're trying to figure out why you go to church every Sunday. Why you give. Why you don't cuss? Why don't you don't throw a temper? They, they, they're trying to figure out. And what they're doing, folks, they're shoving the world down our throats. They're trying to change us. Folks, God and Jesus 
has already changed us, and they just can't see it. Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? And folks, we know even back then the Greeks had so much knowledge. And folks, I'm all for an education, but I'm telling you your education's not going to get you into heaven. I don't care what doctor, uh, PhD, I don't care what's in front of your name or at the end of your name. It's not going to happen. That is not what's, what matters. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of the age? Has God not uh, made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since uh, in the wisdom of, of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of, foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. There are people in life that think we're fools. They think we're ignorant. Yeah, yeah, I can't believe you bought that hook, line, and sinker. And folks, they have not been saved. They have not felt the power of change in their life. They have not had a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus Christ like Paul had. Verse 22, for the Jews request a sign, and, a, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we who preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. They cannot believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He was a carpenter. He didn't go to no school. He don't know that stuff. It's a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Oh, folks, my Bible tells me that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess Jesus is Lord. You will either do that as a Christian, a believer, or as a lost person. And folks, I know people don't like to hear this, but hell is real. It is a real place, and it, reser it is reserved for those who do reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah and as the Lord. Let's see. Number three, Paul's gospel presentation. Festus' strong reaction. I mean, he went, he went bonkers. He could not believe what he was hearing. Back in our text, Acts chapter 26. Verse 27, and then Paul turns his attention to King Agrippa. Do you believe the prophets? What was he trying to get him to say? He's trying to get him to say yes. Because if he believed the prophets, then he is saying everything you're saying is true. Okay? And it says, I know that you believe. What did, what did King Agrippa do? He just didn't answer. All right? And folks, you, you're going to have people like that. When you're witnessing, they're not going to answer. Okay, but it's, you know, it's penetrating their hearts and their minds. So Paul just, you know, I, I'm telling you in a court and all that going on, five seconds seems like eternity there. He didn't react right away, so he says, I know you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Folks, I think this is one of the saddest verses in the Word of God. Why? Because he knew Paul was right. And do you know how, how far some people are going to miss hell? I mean, they're going to go to hell and they're going to miss heaven. You know why? Because they have head knowledge of Jesus, but Jesus is not in their hearts. See, Agrippa knew better, but he was put on the spot and he rejected Paul's gospel message. He said, Paul, I mean, he didn't say it, but literally I think Paul thought, you know, he, he knows what I'm saying, but he's rejecting it. And even at that, almost thou persuaded me. Okay? You got close, Paul, but it doesn't matter. Folks, close isn't good enough, folks. Close isn't good enough. Look at verse 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but all who hear me today might become both 
and almost altogether, such as I am, except in these chains. And he was talking to Festus and Agrippa, and he said, I wish to God both of you would listen to me. You could influence so many people. You could help by your testimony, help God change so many lives. And I got to thinking about that change thing, about being in chains. Guess who was truly in chains? It wasn't the Apostle Paul. I mean, literally he had them on him, okay? But he'd been set free years ago. He was the free man, and he was... And, and, and he truly was the judge. He was the one in that courtroom. Everything was around him, and everything was what he was saying. Verse 30, when he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and all who sat with him. And then they had gone aside. They talked among themselves, saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death in chains. That's a fourth person basically said, he's done nothing wrong. Folks, does that not remind you of Jesus Christ and his trials? Paul was just telling the truth. Paul had the floor. Paul presented the gospel to the highest court in that whole region. Whole region. He did his job. Okay? It wasn't, I mean, whether they got saved or not, he spoke the truth he spoke from his heart. He spoke with love. He spoke with a burden. Verse 32, Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And he said, as a Roman citizen, there is an appeals process. And he said he's already asked for it. And I'm telling you, I think uh, when Paul left that courtroom, Agrippa had a sigh of relief and Festus had a sigh of relief and think, man, I, we need to get him out of here. Okay, I mean, Paul put the pressure on him, and those there, um, these two especially, rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm telling you, he got a not guilty, not guilty. Uh, uh, you know, he, he wasn't guilty of anything, but it broke his heart. It literally broke his heart knowing that these men would probably die without Jesus Christ. In closing, I want, to, I want you to go to me to, to a couple of scriptures, Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to remember, these are Jesus' words, okay? Jesus' words. Matthew seven thirteen. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Okay, enter by the narrow gate. So there's two gates. Okay, the broad gate is wide. Why do you build broad gates? Why do you build wide gates? Because folks, a lot of people have rejected Jesus Christ. A lot of people have sealed their own destiny. And there are many who go by it. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. See, that narrow gate is the gate of Jesus Christ. That narrow gate is the way of the cross. That narrow gate is believing the Word of God and believing what Jesus has done. Then skip down to verse 21. And here's why I say there are false professions of faith. And folks, I did it twice. I did it twice. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Folks, you've got to do it the way God says. You have to come to Jesus. You have to come through the blood of Jesus. Get this, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Folks, that's preaching. Not every preacher that is preaching is going to heaven according to the words of Jesus. Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Oh, folks, three terrible words. Terrible, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And then one last scripture, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. 
Verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus' words, He's saying, take it to the bank. I promise you, this is how it's going to be. All sins will be forgiven of the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may be uttered. Okay, notice the wording, the sons of men, not the sons of God. Before I got saved, I blasphemed God. Before Paul got saved and Saul, he blasphemed God. He rejected God. He rejected God's ways. Twice God came towards me with salvation, and I said no, and I said no. Folks, if he asked me one time, and that's why I say, even in my testimony, if I died before I was 22 years old, I would have went to hell and justified. I mean, God would be justified. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Folks, if you have rejected Christ, if you said, no, I'm going to wait another day, I am telling you, if you don't change, if you don't repent, if you don't invite Christ into your life, you will go to hell according to Jesus Christ himself. But you know what? I got good news for you today. You can accept Christ today. Man, God loves you. God's given some of you another chance. God has got his finger on your heart. God is in your mind. You're thinking, man, and folks, you need to know, this isn't stuff you play with here. I'm talking about your eternal destiny depends on what you do with Jesus. Folks, you've got to know that Jesus is the Son of God. You've got to believe that he lived a perfect life. You've got to believe that he died on the cross and arose on the third day. You have to invite him into your life. You have to say, Lord, I have messed up. I have done it my way. And now I want to do it your way. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're here today, and God is speaking to you through the Holy Spirit, I don't want no instruments yet. Please, no instruments yet. But do you know for sure? Are you sure that if you died today, you would go to heaven? Oh, I'm telling you, folks, God saves. God saves. And I want to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And I'm telling you, God will save you if you will come to Him, if you will humbly bow your head, if you will humbly pray this prayer with me. I'm going to pray it out loud, but I want you to pray it to yourself. I'll pray it out loud, I'll, but I want you to pray it to yourself. If you are not sure that you're going to heaven, would you pray this prayer with me? Our Heavenly Father, just pray it to yourself. God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know Christ has died for me. God, I know that I'm not saved. You have said it again today that I'm not saved. And God, I want to be saved. God, I want you to come into my life. God, I want you to save me. God, I believe in you. I believe that you are the Son of God. God, I humbly come to you I want to repent of my sin. I want to say I'm sorry for my sin. And God, with your help, I know I can change. God, I give you my life. I give you everything. God, I have nothing to give you, but I give you everything, my life, everything about me. So God, please save me. Teach me to love you. Teach me to walk with you. Teach me to serve you. In Jesus' name, I pray. And before we say amen, ever head bowed and ever eye closed, if you're here today and you'll be a witness it before Christ and before God, if you prayed that prayer, would you, would you, and, and again, folks, I'm not coming to you. I'm not going to call you out. 
You just do what God tells you to do. But if you, you prayed that prayer and, and you want to just seal it, you want to let God know, I'm raising my hand right now. I prayed that prayer today. Would you just lift your hand up right now? Yes. Anybody else? Would you lift your hand up? Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? Just hold it up there for a second. If you lifted it up, hold it up there. Father, you've seen these two hands. God, we're not calling out anybody, but your Bible says, Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father which is in heaven. So God, I pray that today would be the victory day. God, I pray that they would just step out. Lord, I'm not going to pressure them. I'm not going to put it on them. Lord, just if, if you tell them, Lord, step out and come. And God, all of the church, all of heaven will rejoice with what uh, they have done. Maybe there are Christians here that need to rededicate their life or come for baptism or come for church membership. God, it is you. It's your time. This is your invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet on this first note? Don't wait on anyone else. On this first verse, you come.